Thank you. Uh, yeah, so if the title doesn't ring any bell, uh, I've been looking for a title for this for a year. So it's a bit of an invention, but uh, I guess it conveys the idea. Uh, so before I start, I'm, doing, I'm going to do two things. Uh, first, I'm going to make sure we are all on the same uh, page in terms of immersive technologies, which is a term I'm going to use a lot. Um, so are you all familiar with like VR, AR, these kind of things? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly re-explain the basics. So if you see someone like this lady with a mask in front of her face, and if obviously the mask is like hiding the reality, it doesn't need to be a cardboard mask, it can be a plastic one. I just took this one because the image was nice. Uh, so this is virtual reality because the reality is occluded and you have a new reality that's replacing uh, what you see normally, okay? Uh, if you see this guy, who's obviously an actor, um, <laughs> pretending to be doing something very smart, uh, what you can see here is like he's seeing reality with some kind of 3D element. Uh, in that case, it's augmented reality because you augment the, what you see with some kind of virtual things, okay? Uh, and if it's a phone, it's also augmented reality. The reason for this, it's at the moment much easier and cheaper to do augmented reality with phones. But really, um, everything on the right, phone, and this is AR, augmented reality, and on the left, it's VR. So I'm just going to focus on these two use cases. So when I say AR, I'm speaking about someone with glasses who can see reality and virtual things. And when I say VR, I'm speaking about more uh, completely virtual things. Does it make sense or, yeah, okay. So the second thing I'm going to do is just introduce myself a bit more. It was a very good intro. It's more to, um, to for, for you to have an idea of where I come from uh, literally and in my argumentation. Uh, so I was born at a time where personal computers were not really a thing. I mean, there were some cool guys like this guy doing stuff with it, but mostly we were playing uh, in the garden and doing you know physical things. So it's not, my hut, but we were doing this kind of things. Um, so yeah, when I came to study and uh, like find a job for myself, I was much more into uh, doing physical things. So that's a bunch of stuff I've been working on over the years. So some of them are like, uh, yeah, pure engineering. Some are more like design. Some are more like installation. Um, but in parallel to that, I was quite interested in photography and filmmaking. So one of the techniques that's used a lot in filmmaking is uh, motion tracking and compositing. And you'll understand the link uh, soon. So the reason why I got interested in this is um, because you can basically, so it's really bad. I did it for a friend of mine uh, six or seven years ago. But it's really like being able to showcase um, a design, something that doesn't exist yet, in a real context. So in this case, you can see, for instance, the size of the car. It gives you an idea of what it looks like, right? So it's a bit more interesting than just making an animation in 3D. Um, and in parallel to that, uh, I discovered at the beginning the DK1, which uh, I thought, because of my experimentation with, uh, with video and motion tracking, was quite an interesting thing uh, for design in the sense that it could be an interesting thing you could use to visualize design. So it's really the idea of designing with immersive technologies. Uh, and of course, you start to think about design and immersive technologies, and then you're like, ah, yeah, but there is this new field that's going to open up, which is who's going to design for all these things, because we're going to create world, we're going to create a lot of content. And long story short, uh, I met Charlie at some point, and we started Wolf, uh, and I think one angle I can put what we do is we design with uh, immersive tech and we design for immersive tech, so we create content. Um, and that's all about us and for the intro, now I'm going to dive into the subject. So first I'm going to speak about uh, physical design, so you know, traditional product design and industrial design. I assume most of you guys are more digital uh, UX designers, right? Yes, no, okay. I mean, it doesn't matter, I, I'm just going to uh, explain everything I want to say. Um, so yeah, in general, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with the concept of form follow functions. Form follow function, yeah. So it's something that comes from an architect. Uh, it's late 19th century. 
it's quite funny because actually I think this guy didn't completely agree himself with his theory because he's also the father of uh, skyscrapers, which you could argue uh, are not necessarily the most logical thing that you would build if the function is for people to live somewhere. Um, and um, yeah, it was soon like reduced into this mantra of industrial design form follows function. And actually, a lot of architects and designers don't agree with that at all. Uh, Frank Gehry, for instance, say that he has no responsibility whatsoever on the function. <laughs> but, uh, but, but still, it's not pure sculpture, right? You can still go inside. Uh, if it's an, I think this is a theater, but I'm not sure. I mean, it still has a function. So maybe another way to say it, and I wish I had found this because I really found it, but then I found on Google that some other people have thought about it. I wish I could say tonight, it's not form follows function, it's form allows function, but I'm not the first to have this idea. So this is probably very true for everything you see in the physical design space, architecture, industrial design. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I have some examples. So a phone, uh, if you think you have a lot of you know, freedom in the way you design a phone, well, one thing that's going to drag you back to reality is that it has to fit in a pocket. So the shape of a phone tells you a lot about the shape of the human body, right? If you go to IKEA and you think you have a lot of choice and you think an IKEA a furniture designer has a lot of fun doing IKEA furniture and you look at everything they do, the reality is all those things that are all very different, right? Maybe not when I go fast. They all have to be flat packed to be delivered to your place. So that's actually a massive constraint uh, and one of the big functions of a design uh, by IKEA. So long story short, uh, we can infer that in the physical design space, uh, form and functions are intrinsically linked uh, and it's not something that could change, right? Now, if I look at digital product, and that's where I'm probably going to say things that you won't agree with, uh, I will try to be really careful. Uh, the paradigm is completely different. So as far as I've been able to imagine, I don't think there are many physical constraints. So I was thinking maybe if it's a kid and the tablet is really big, you have to make sure that the buttons are accessible. So that's kind of like the only use case where I was like, okay, maybe in this case, you have to make sure that the shape of what you're designing has to like, uh, follow some kind of human constraint. Uh, and then I realized that there was this big thing of skeuomorphism. Uh, are you all familiar with this concept? OK, so I'm still going to explain it a bit for those who are not, <laughs> and also because I have the slides anyway. Uh, so skeuomorphism, it's actually not something that comes from uh, UX and UI design, which is something I thought. It's a very old thing. So it's when your design uh, has some cues of the design it's inheriting from. So it's kind of a weird sentence. Uh, basically, if you look at this beautiful car from the 60s or 70s, you see that the plastic on the side is imitating wood. And the reason for that is because the car is the legacy of the horse carriage, and the horse carriage was made of wood. OK, so some designer at this moment thought that it would be a great idea to put wood on a car. Um, another example that's actually a really nice example. So I don't know if you can see my mouse. No, OK. Uh, so if you look at a Greek temple, at the top of the temple, you have this kind of vertical lines. And they actually represent the wooden beams of the time where temples and huts were made of wood. So the way you know, the first temples were designed is, uh, uh, contains a lot of skeuomorph of the time it was made of wood and clay. Um, so coming back to digital, uh, the digital field, um, I mean, if I was very sarcastic, I would say, OK, skeuomorph in digital, it's basically Apple leading the way. So when Apple says that a microphone app should look like a microphone, everybody says, great idea. And when Apple says, actually, it should not, everybody is like, ah, yeah, no, skeuomorph was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, but I found an example. Actually, it's something I've used for years. So it's called Reason. It's something to make music. Uh, and the interface hasn't changed in 20 years. Uh, and basically what they do, it's very simple, is to just replicate exactly the real instrument uh, in a digital way. What's crazy is if you press tab, uh, it turns, you see the cables, but you can also like, literally drag the cable and replug them. <laughs> and the behavior of your instrument will really follow what you do. So, I mean, 
uh, I think you all have worked on, uh, on like, you know, digital products. If you imagine having to reinvent all the behaviors and all the way uh, this kind of thing would work without looking at how it works in reality, it would be pretty complex. So maybe in this case, it's quite a good idea to have used QMorph as, a, you know, the base rule of how to design the software. Anyway, except for all this, and except for the legacy of the gestures that people are used to use and expecting, so you know, if you do a nap uh, tomorrow, you're not going to do something that doesn't zoom with pinching, doesn't scroll, because you're just going to confuse people. But apart from these things, you can say that in the digital world, it's pretty much a blank canvas. So as a designer, in theory, you could do pretty much what you want. You don't have to respect physics rules as you have to do in the physical world. You don't have to respect too much the um, uh, morphology of a human person because it's already dealt, dealt for you by the size of the device. So it's pretty much a blank canvas. And that's why it's interesting. Because uh, in the coming years, devices that you're very familiar with and that have a screen are very likely to disappear. So if we look at computers, TVs, Watch, oh, so it's not a screen, but if you look at a watch like this, it is a screen as well. All these are going to be replaced by glasses. So this is basically an image of AR glasses. So the idea is to say that, you know, if you have uh, augmented reality glasses that you wear with you all the time, you don't need to have a laptop, you don't need your phone, you don't need your watch, and all this, right? Um, and it, I mean, it could be glasses, but it could also be, um, contact lenses, or even something that, you know, is not physical. Um, if you have a bit more imagination, you could imagine that radio could disappear, cameras, wallets, and why not uh, pencils. So uh, it leads us to two questions. Uh, if we mix the, the physical and the digital world as described before, first question is, does it mean that everything physical that is you know, turned into an AR avatar becomes a UI. So basically, the question of how you design a computer is essentially a UI question. How you design a phone is a UI question. And usually, it's the vision that you have in any, if you look at stock images on Google of uh, augmented reality, you find this everywhere. So, you know, it's the kind of Iron Man vision of the future where everything is a UI floating around you. And why not? Uh, or, because everything is possible, maybe everything becomes a digital version of what it was in reality. So, you know, a watch seen in AR is literally a watch as it looked in reality. It's just that it's not physical. Why not? So it's kind of like a new beginning for Skewmorph that suddenly, you know, becomes um, the new rule of design. So then my question, if it's the second case, is uh, how do you design a camera, for instance? Do you make an old camera? You know, so if you have this avatar of a camera, do you do something of the 19th century because it's cool? Or do you make a modern DSLR? Or do you make, you know, a 360 camera? And, you know, where do you put the cursor? Uh, because QMorph is not answering all the questions. At some point, you have to decide where you put the, the cursor. I'm not asking you to answer this question uh, because we have some uh, data already. So the thing is, I was speaking about augmented reality, which is maybe happening in five years, maybe 10. I think it's going to be more five than 10, but it's not really the debate. Uh, what is already uh, happening today, and that's what we do at Wolf every day, is the virtual reality. We already produce content for virtual reality. So uh, obviously, people play games in VR. That's the thing everybody knows. Um, they also discover places they have never been to. So if you've never tried uh, Google Earth in VR, it's quite an interesting thing. They create content. Uh, there are quite a few uh, applications today that you can use to create in VR. They create music. Uh, they visualize things that are very hard to visualize uh, in another way. They train. So that's probably one of the biggest segments in the coming years of uh, yeah, making money with VR, basically, apart from marketing. Uh, they meet other people, so right now you might find it funny or creepy, but you know, if you told someone in the 90s about Facebook or WhatsApp, they would probably have thought the same. Um, they do professional meetings. I think it's kind of bullshit, this one. <laughs> but technically, it's possible. Um, so all this means that to create all these experiences, you have a lot of design work, right? Uh, this is something we finished recently, so I can tell you. Just to have this one room, 
uh, with this level of details in the room, uh, there is a lot of sketching involved, the same way you would do for physical things, uh, like real architecture plans of the room. You know, of course, you don't have to make sure that it's not going to fall down, but still, to a certain extent, you put a lot of attention in the details, the same way you would do for a real thing. So at this point, you might ask me, is that really new? Uh, and I've been asking myself, like, is it really a new thing? And uh, maybe not, because if you look at uh, movies, with, I mean, it's essentially you know, designing props. So is it a new segment of product design when you design props? And the answer to that is, I think it's new, because uh, interactions were never the problem for cinema. So you know, if you look at these things, they are just like mock-ups for, uh, for the sake of you know, shooting something that's going to look in a certain way where you know the environment and everything that's happening is something you know in advance. Now we are speaking about uh, creating product that you will interact with the same way my computer is a product I interact with, right? So that leads us back to our camera question. How would you go in designing a camera, um, a virtual camera that you see through augmented reality, for instance, or virtual reality? Uh, and I take this example because that's something we've tried. So in 2016, we released something called Magic Hour. It's a very simple, I have a video. Um, it's a very simple app that is supposed to teach you photography. Uh, so you have this kind of teacher who tells you you should try to take a picture of this guy and gives you feedback when you do the, all the settings, right? Um, but the thing is, the first version we did, uh, there was not too much question about the design because we used, uh, we did it on iOS. And basically on iOS, people already know how to take pictures. So all the design questions of the interface were kind of aesthetical question, but we didn't reinvent the way you would take a picture. Uh, I think even this button is the standard button that was used on iOS at the time, so very simple. Uh, and then as we were doing VR, and this was slightly off what we were doing, we were like, ah, yeah, what happens if we translate Magic Hour into a VR app? So most of the world, the props, everything, you know, you can take it from one platform to another easy. But then there was the question again of how do we design the camera? Like what, what is the camera in the VR uh, context? Uh, how does it work? How people interact with it? And at the time, uh, my depth of thinking in this, uh, in this field was non-existent. So that's, I mean, if we were to do this exercise today, I would have a lot of ideas like, you know, let's experiment with scale, let's do this, let's do that at the time. And that's a bit how we started to think about these questions. We just went, you know, in all the directions. So uh, I kept three that are interesting. The first one, which was saying, uh, okay, so it's a camera. And what if when you take a picture, you get inside the camera? I mean, it's virtual reality, you can do whatever. So you basically become you know, big like this and you're inside the viewfinder. So this is a viewfinder of a camera. And then we are like, okay, where do, where do we put the controls? So you know, how do you, uh, we had all this interface on the iPad, but how do you control the camera? So then we added these wheels. So it's basically a tank, you're inside your camera and you know, you're doing like aperture, like zooming. Really fun, <laughs> but not really a camera experience. Like, you know, you get really away from the photography learning experience. So then we did something much, I guess, sounds much more classical, but we just like used a transparent surface as a camera. So it's kind of a big tablet. It's just that it's a tablet that floats in space. So it felt like a frame. Quite nice, uh, but yeah. like. Every time we would add a button, it, you, know, you lose this kind of minimal thing. So we ended up uh, with this, which I guess today I would call a skew morph because it's pretty much a very big camera. Um, and it, I mean, we have a few uh, videos where you can see how it works. So I wish I could tell you, like, you know, this is the way you have to do, we found it and everything. Uh, for us, it was really satisfying. We felt like, oh yeah, it works, really fun, like good camera experience. The reality is every time someone tries, uh, they don't get anything of how to use it. Uh, which again, is very hard to use as a learning experience because uh, what you discover when you start to do a lot of virtual reality is that the landscape of the devices looks like this. And I mean, this is just six I found on the internet before coming. Um, 
So basically, none of the manufacturers use the same device. So nobody expects a behavior. Nobody has any clue of what they're doing. So it's pretty much as if you were you know, designing an app for iPhone that runs on an old phone that's used by people with like, you know, gloves. Um, but the good news is I still have some uh, conclusions to share with you. So the perspective um, on design um, looking in the future and the emergence of these technologies. Um, and it's all pretty positive. Uh, first, I think it's going to be more freedom because if you mix you know, the thinking of physical design with the freedom of digital design, I think you get into something that's pretty interesting. You don't have to deal with physics, with atoms. So you know, there is this kind of standard image of uh, immersive technology where everything floats in space. Uh, actually, it's pretty cool to not have even to deal with physics. You can, uh, as we've seen a bit with the camera, deal with uh, you know change scale. So you can imagine that uh, your phone in the future, when it's not a physical phone, could have a certain shape at some point and change shape uh, at another point. Which means that uh, I think designers will have to learn how to use time as a new dimension. So the same way we managed, we mastered you know two dimensions to express an ID, and then we had to master three dimensions to express IDs. I mean, at least in industrial design. Uh, I would think that time is going to be important, and there are very there are different ways you can see that. But maybe an easy image is to say, for instance, a product could adapt to you uh, over the course of your life. So you know, what you design is not one product that looks like this, but it's more um, something that can evolve into different shapes. But then, obviously, how are you going to know? You know what people want the product to do at each point, which leads me to the next thought, which is probably artificial intelligence is going to become an important tool for design. Uh, so we use for web responsive design, which is essentially respons uh, yeah, responsive to your, the size of your screen. Uh, in this case, it's really saying, you know, design that adapts to you. And then uh, it could lead us to very evil things if we mix it with the talk of before. Um, but yeah, you know, you could imagine that uh, things sh uh, change as, uh, as you use them. And the final one, which is probably the most positive, um, and I mean, at least in my view, I think it's an opportunity for designers to come back to a more holistic approach to design. Uh, I just took three figures. I mean, there are a lot, so it's a bit of a random selection, but uh, Marianne Brandt, Raymond Louis, and Walter Gropius. Um, so, Gropius is the founder of Boaos. Louis is the kind of American, actually it's French, uh, icon of industrial design. And Marianne Brandt is a German um, a Boaos as well student. Uh, and all of them, they all share that they are, you know, amongst the 20 personalities you will find on Wikipedia on design. None of them were trained as designer. Marianne was trained as a painter, uh, Louis as an engineer, and Gropius as an architect. Actually, a lot of designers were architects, uh, I mean, industrial designers. Uh, and I think what's interesting when you look at their life is they've been touching at a lot of subjects, and I think it has informed their um, design philosophy, and they are also people who have had a big impact on what we consider as design today. So maybe we are at the same tipping point where you know, things can be reinvented and people can you know, broaden their scope of interest instead of specializing too much in what field. And I hope it's a nice perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have uh, more questions? Yeah. I, just for your current product, who is your main target group? Like, who are those people? Are they, like, how old are they? Are they early adopters? Or, like, where are they are? Um, so it's a good question. We do, so today we do mostly uh, marketing experiences, so installations, which in a way makes the job very easy because you completely master what's going to happen, you know, you know how people are going to use the product. Uh, usually, the installation is manned as well, so you have a person who can onboard people, explain them the basics. Um, so I would say um, who they are exactly, we don't really care. But what we know is none of them, we assume that none of them have used VR before. 
um, which has a big influence in the, on the way we design. So when I was saying, you know, you have to design for people with gloves, literally our rule, so we use controllers where you have 10 buttons on the left, 10 buttons on the right. Our internal rule uh, in Wolf is that we use one button on the left and one button on the right maximum, which limits a lot the interactions you can do. But you know, at least you know that everyone is going to have the full experience. Because if you design something where you have all these possibilities, but people see that, it's a bad design. So as of today, it's more uh, the knowledge that people have of the technology than there are real demographics that matters, I think. Uh, and also, kids are not allowed technically to use VR. I think the recommendation from doctors is nobody under 13. So yeah, for us, we see people between 15 and 60, and they usually have the same behavior. I will make an so thank you so much. Very, very interesting. I'll make an assumption, but I think I'm quite right. Humans are lazy. All right. So with this assumption, what like in the VR world, what will beat humans, let's say, playing video games, sitting down on their couches, just moving their thumbs yeah. against them, standing up? moving their body or whatever, or like you use the example of the laptop. If we have no laptop, moving our arms for 15 minutes like this, is like Johnny Mnemonic, whatever, it's quite, like really, can I just rest them on the table and use like my keyboard here? Yeah. Uh, how do you see VR with that perspective in mind? Uh, first, I agree. I mean, I think, um, I mean, one, one side answer to your question, like uh, everything that has to do with, you know, body interaction that you see in videos, uh, you know, hand tracking, everybody is looking at hand tracking at the moment. Uh, we are pretty skeptical for this reason. It's like, okay, even if technically you can track your hand, like we will go from a place where I can do everything with my thumb to something where I have to move my body. So if it's to do exactly the same thing, you know, if physical computing means a giant UI where I see my emails and to, you know, put an email in the bin, I have to do that instead of like, you know, a little thing. I think it's nice in a video, but it's probably not going to make too much sense. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Then VR as a gaming thing that replaces phone. I don't know. I mean, we don't do a gaming things. Uh, but what I know or what I've seen in the gaming space, it's usually very different games. So usually they have much less depth, uh, so they will not necessarily be um, strategy games, although, I mean, this could change, but it will be more like action-based and something that really capitalizes on the fact that it's immersive. Um, so I think it's more opening a new space, but that's for VR and that's for gaming. Uh, I think AR, uh, it's, it's going to be productivity, it's going to replace things that are around us. So um, in an ideal world, I mean, I, I don't know if it's ideal, but in an ideal technological world, everything that you can do today on your phone, you can do it in AR. So you, I mean, if really the first step has to be this, you could imagine that uh, your phone in AR is exactly the same, and it's just that, you know, it's not tangible, which maybe is a big problem, I don't know. I don't think tangibility of mundane things like your phone is going to be a problem. You know, not being able to touch uh, a cup or something like this probably is a problem, but uh, yeah, a phone is a very abstract thing. I think we, we've adapted to the iPhone in a few years and it could disappear as quickly, I think, but. Uh, Hi, thanks for your nice presentation. I was wondering if you had anything to say about the risk of um, overusing AR or even more so VR and kind of losing track of the physical reality and having people having psychotic, um, I don't know, breakdowns or just, you know, starting more and more to lose the, the sense of physicality. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I have anything super uh, original to say on this, and I think you described very well the potential risk. Um, it's a new, 
I mean, I'm not advocating the medium, by the way. It's like something we do because we find it interesting and defining at the point we are in. But personally, I, I don't know if it's something that I want more or less in, in our life. You know, it's just something that's happening. Um, I see two problems. So first, um, to come back to the talk that was before, if we don't solve the problems of uh, very intrusive uh, marketing techniques, you know, putting guilt in you, I mean, if you multiply this by VR or AR or anything immersive, it's like hell. It's like, you know, things around you all the time. And yeah, I think you can become psychotic very quickly. And then there is the te technological side of, you know, does a screen, uh, does it have an impact on your eyes, on your brain? And, and I'm pretty sure that, that yes, the same way, you know, you can see when you spend a day on your laptop, you cannot sleep sometime at night. Um, so I would say the technological side, we will probably adapt to it. And this can be, you know, uh, we can create rules for ourselves the same way. I don't know. Personally, I try to not use my laptop after 9 or 10 in the evening. Uh, for the more human-driven side of things, like this ethical question of design, uh, I think this is a massive danger. And we, that's why I think it's a super interesting question. If we cannot solve it on mobile and traditional device, uh, when it becomes immersive, it's... Uh, yeah, hell. Thank you very much. More questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, you spoke about the camera project you worked on, and you said that one of the biggest challenges you had was there wasn't much of a pattern, so people didn't really know how to interact with it, how do you, how yeah. do you use it. What are some of the challenges that you saw as a new adopter of the technology, and how did you help the users overcome those challenges? Um, so you're asking how we managed to overcome this challenge? Well, in this case, I mean, I would say it's a bad design. So technically, what we've done, we would have to redo some of it if we wanted to push it forward. Um, but in the meantime, people might have uh, progressed in their understanding of the, of the thing. And, and I don't have a definite answer. I cannot say it's a good design, but people are stupid. And I cannot say, you know, it's a bad design. It's just we don't know because for us, when we tried it, it made sense. Uh, I think we had a limited amount of friends who tried it and who knew a bit the technology for, it, for who it made sense. But definitely, if I give it to my mom, she's just like, you know, she's going to teleport while she's trying to click on something. That's really the kind of frame you have. It's like people get really frustrated. So in a way, terrible design for, uh, for these demographics of people who have never used it. Uh, so on this, we haven't overcome it, but now every time we do anything interactive, it's like we keep it super, super stupid and super simple to the point that sometimes we fake interactions. So it feels a bit stupid, but you know, sometimes, I don't know, say um, to, to go somewhere, you have to laser point the place and click, and you realize that some people will not laser point the, the, the right place, and they will click, and they will it will get frustrating because they're like, oh, I'm trying to go there. So, I mean, you can, you know, change the way you do your target or you can just say, you know what, anywhere people click, it's going to teleport. And nine, in an experience that lasts for five, 10 minutes, I guarantee that nobody is going to see the difference. So they will, everybody will try to click, you know, properly to aim and to click, but the reality is they could click anywhere and it would work. So from the design perspective, you're like, ah, it's like, why do they click? It could be automatic. But actually, from the user point of view, they have a sense of, you know, they're doing something. Uh, and, it, and for them, it feels nice because there is a kind of laser pointer. So, you know, they... So today, it's super simple. That's the way we solve it. Um, and I, I don't think there is any other way for now. More questions? Anybody? Uh, Just a design question. So at the beginning, you mentioned that you're trying to make a lot of um, details in the, the or these virtual realities. 
while as you so, so want to make these whole experiences as simple as possible. I'm trying to think the um, earlier stage of the web, when it was it, at the very beginning of the web design, it was very complicated and there was no user experience research. So you're just putting everything there. Um, whereas I'm thinking probably in, I don't know how long a year's time, then you probably will get some UX experience for the virtual reality, I guess. But um, what I'm trying to think is, is it actually a good thing to make all these details, you know? Like, would it be mm. better even making even just simpler? Um, um. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess the question is, uh, in a way, is it better to be at the very beginning of something? Like, what's the value of you know, the amazing work that some people have put together in the 90s on the web that today could be done in five minutes by a teenager. Um, and, and that on top of that is not really relevant to the way we consume content on the web today. That's kind of the question, right? So why do we put so much energy and, and in the details of what we do? No, no, but it's a good question. Um, I think the value of the work is not in the same place. Like if today there is uh, there is a big problem that there is no unified UX theory, basically. So it limits a lot what we can do. Uh, and it limits our audience as well, because it's a small thing. It's mostly for marketing purpose. Uh, or innovation within companies, which means that it's even less spread, because you cannot even speak about it uh, in conference. Um, but the fact that there are no rules means that you can experiment, you can create your own rules. Uh, and you know sometimes you will meet very inspiring designers who were there in the 90s and who will show you stuff that they've done and you don't believe that this can have been done 20 years ago. Uh, you know, the, the depths of thinking and what they were trying to achieve, you're like, wow, that's crazy. So hopefully that's what is happening today with this medium and hopefully when we look back, you know, in 10 or 20 years, if we are still doing the same, um, hopefully, you know, it's something that we'll, we'll find very interesting because the way we think about things you know, technology changes, but the depths and the philosophy you put in design, uh, I mean, changes as well, but it, it's not because we're in 2018 that, uh, you know, my design philosophy is more interesting than the design philosophy of these guys who were designers 100 years ago. Um, so this stays the same, and in the course of your life, it evolves, but it's not linked to the technology, right? So. Yeah, I think uh, for now it makes sense to do these, these explorations, and, and we learn, uh, so yeah. One more question before we finish. Anyone? No? Cool. Thank you. Thank you.